The Internet of Federated Things is a paper led by the University of Michigan and written in collaboration with multiple faculty with a wide variety of expertise and across multiple universities. It describes our vision for the future of Internet of Things alongside data-driven approaches to bring this vision into reality. So for this talk, I will start by introducing the current state of IoT. Then I will introduce our vision for the future of IoT. We, we term this vision as the Internet of Federated Things. And then I will discuss data-driven approaches to bring this vision into reality. Specifically, I will discuss global modeling, personalized modeling, and meta-learning. I will explain those as, as we move forward. And finally, I'll talk about how IOFT will affect multiple applications. This, is, this will be a very brief discussion, and I'll point you to the paper for more an in-depth discussion on, on, on how applications, different applications, be it manufacturing, business, energy, transportation, and others, will be affected by IOFT through the lens of domain experts. So what is Internet of Things? Internet of Things is basically a smart and connected system. So in, in traditional days, we just had the physical components that comprise the system. Then what happened came this industrial revolution and came with it our ability to, comment, to collect this immense amount of data. We had sensors, sensor prices became $0.48 on average nowadays, they became very cheap. We had those wireless networks, data storage and management systems. We were collecting a lot of data. And this, what, this is what moved our traditional systems into a, a connected system. But the hope of IoT is to exploit data analytics and smart decision-making to move from a merely connected system to a smart and connected system. So this is the, the key idea of, a, of, a, of an IoT system. For the physical components, we have connectivity, which allows data acquisition. And then we have smartness, which enables analyzing this data in order to do smart decisions. So what are the basic features? As I mentioned, connectivity, data from multiple similar units. Take an example, cars on the road. Right now, many companies have some, some services where they monitor, where they have sensors on your cars and they're monitoring the performance to keep you informed about the health of the, your vehicle. We have data from multiple similar units that are collected often in real time. And, and this, this is what brings connectivity into play. And then we have smartness because we have data from multiple similar units. We can compare their operations, extract some useful information to enable accurate prediction and control. And one can really argue that this notion is a very old notion when artisans used to come together to perfect their craft in geographically close locations. So just to give an example, and this is my aforementioned example about uh, IoT, so take, for example, here, close to the University of Michigan, we, had, we have Ford Sinks and GM's OnStar system. So both of them are teleservice systems where they have sensors on the cars on the road. And, and then as you, drive your, as you drive your vehicle, data is uploaded to a cloud, to a back processing office. This data is analyzed in the back processing office and then service alerts are sent back to the clients. Okay, and as I mentioned, the goal is to keep the driver informed about the health of their vehicle. So what are some key features in the current IoT system? There are gigantic amounts of data being uploaded to a cloud. Models are learned in this cloud, such as predictive maintenance, diagnostics, text, text prediction. And then models are sent back from the cloud to the edge device. This is the current state in many applications. Google, let's say, and Apple, how do they lear learn models? They extract some data from devices and they learn more big, big models based on their clouds. And we have seen also a lot of uh, advancements in cloud systems. We have seen many companies using AWS, Azure as their cloud processing center or their back office processing center, okay? But what are some obvious drawbacks of such a system? First of all, as we collect more and more data, and the frequency of this data becomes larger and larger. The amount of storage needs becomes huge and very costly. Sometimes it's much, it is, exceeds what any processing center can hold. 
Okay. Another thing that is an immense communication burden, uploading data to the cloud is very costly and exploits a lot of our internet bandwidth and often is not practical, specifically when you're collecting huge amounts of data with high frequency. There is also deployment latency. Deployment latency because we're learning models on our cloud. And then deployment happens after we send back those models. So there is some unreliable connections or our notifications or service alerts do not reach the driver. Then there is a key issue here. And finally, which is very obvious is privacy. The need to upload raw data to a cloud is an infringement on privacy. Actually, it also benefits large enterprises that are capable of building their own cloud infrastructures or using their own private cloud infrastructures at the expense of smaller entities. Even if smaller entities can have their private cloud infrastructures, probably they will not be able to collect enough data to learn big, meaningful big data analytics. So there are some obvious drawbacks in today's IoT system. However, IoT is changing. And I like to think about it in this way. IoT was set forth with this immense advance in communication, sensors, collecting data everywhere, wireless networks. But what is changing nowadays is that the edge has more computational power. Our phones right now have computational power sometimes comparable to laptops we use in everyday, everyday use laptops. Wearable devices such as Apple Watches have a lot of computational power. 3D printers nowadays, most of them are connected with a small computer or AI chip, Raspberry Pi, and they have the ability to do computations. Similarly, autonomous cars, most autonomous cars right now have very powerful AI chips. And a big reason behind this, this shortage of AI chips right now is that most edge devices have AI chips installed on them. So this poses a, a fundamental question for IoT. How can we exploit the computational power that is now available at the edge device on our phones, on our wearable devices, on our cars, on our 3D printers? Instead of uploading the, all the data to the cloud, can we exploit the compute power at the edge? And this, this major and fundamental change of IoT is what sets forth the Internet of Federated Things. The Internet of Federated Things basically is based on one simple idea, exploiting compute resources at the edge. But what does that make possible? If we are able to exploit compute resources at the edge, then fundamentally, we do not need to share data anymore. We can do some small computations locally and only share whatever is needed. Rather than share the entire data set, we only share whatever is needed to achieve the smart component of IoT. And by this, IoT becomes somehow decentralized. It moves away from the cloud to the crowd, to the edge devices. So we turn the system or the future of IoT as the Internet of Federated Things. And the word federated here refers to some level of autonomy for each IoT device. And, and the underlying data analytics framework that makes IoFT possible is called federated analytics or federated learning. And it's also inspired by the recent advance and, and this explosive interest in decentralized model learning often coined as federated learning or federated data analytics. So let me start with a very simple example. This is one possible system. Let's keep the cloud in the system. Let's assume there is a cloud here defined as a central orchestrator and we have edge devices say cars on the road or phones. So let's ask a simple question. What if the cloud would like to learn the mean over some feature, y bar over some feature, y over all clients? Okay. So in a traditional IoT system where edge devices do not have compute power, what's happening is we are uploading all our data to the cloud and the cloud just takes an average over all the data. However, if edge devices have some compute resources, then what we can do is simply each device can do a simply a simple averaging calculation, calculate yi bar, and, do, and send it back to the server. And clearly, yi bar is a sufficient statistic for me to learn or for the cloud to learn y bar. So what's the key idea here is that instead of sharing my entire raw data, I exploited my computational resources did some small computations, 
and only share whatever the cloud is needed. And this is why the cloud right now becomes more of an orchestrator. Most of the data analytics is not being done on the cloud. Basically, the cloud is orchestrating the process. So this is one structure of IOFT. Definitely, there, be, there can be multiple structures, but just to, to illustrate the example here. However, obviously, the models that we often learn on the cloud are much more complicated than just learning a mean. Often, we're learning a deep neural network. We're learning doing some predictive maintenance modeling. So since the models become more and more complex, this procedure becomes more iterative in the sense that the cloud selects some devices or possibly all the devices, sends the devices, for example, a training procedure or a model to learn. It tells them, okay, please learn this neural network. Okay, help me learn this neural network. Then each device, what each device does is they use their, their data to do updates, to update the model or to do focus updates. For, for example, in a deep network, they can do some small steps of optimization or stochastic gradient descent to update their weights. And then instead of sharing the raw data to the cloud, they're only sharing their focus updates. And then the cloud aggregates, acts as an aggregator or an integration point of the focus updates from each client. And this procedure is iterated over multiple rounds. The cloud does some aggregation. It sends it to the clients. The clients use their local data to do local computations. They send updates, focused updates. They do not send their entire data. They send whatever they were able to learn using their local computations. And then this procedure is iterated until some stopping criteria is met. So this, this idea is actually very simple. It's based on just exploiting the compute resources at the edge, but actually it sets forth many intrinsic advantages. And indeed, it can be a revolutionary. So the first advantage, which is very clear, is privacy. By bringing training to the edge, we are not anymore sharing our variable information or our raw, raw data. Instead, it is kept local and never shared. Okay, we're sharing just some listed sets. And often in many situations, it's very hard to recover the entire data set just from a summary statistic point of view, from just from the focus update. Autonomy. Right now, IOFT devices have, have local computations, have local models, they can be under independent control and they can actually opt out of this collaborative process. Computation is, is a big advantage. Right now, we are not more anymore fitting those big models on the cloud. Actually, most companies, they do not use all their data to fit those big models. It might take weeks, if not months and years. What they do is they try to do some filtering, they subsample the data and fit models based on some representative samples. However, what's happening right now is companies or the cloud is exploiting the compute resources at the edge. And by such, massive parallelization becomes a reality. Then we have cost. We are definitely reducing the storage costs at the cloud. The cloud is only an orchestrator of this procedure. More importantly, less information is transmitted to the cloud. We're not any for more sending entire data sets. We're sending summary statistics, okay? So we're efficiently utilizing network bandwidth. Okay, so cost from the cost is definitely a big, big advantage here in the sense we have less storage and we're sending less information over. Okay, fast alerts and decisions. Right now we have a local model. Alerts and decisions can be achieved at the edge because we have our model locally. Okay, fast encryption is, is an obvious advantage because it's much easier to encrypt or add some noise perhaps to a focus update, recall the example of the mean, rather than encrypting an entire data set. We can actually achieve encryption with much better guarantees if we just encrypt focus updates. Resilience, right now, since we have a focus, we have a local model, common cause failures that can happen on the cloud, we are resilient or IOFT devices can be resilient to such failures. Diversity and fairness is also a big advantage. Think about hospitals, previously two hospitals it was very hard for them to collaborate and share data to learn better models because of the HIPAA Act. However, with such an IOFT system, they can actually collaborate without sharing raw, raw data. This is why IOFT enables <coughs> integrating information across entities that could not have done that before. Mineral infrastructure, 
as, as AI chips infiltrate the market more and more, the infrastructure needed to achieve the transition from IoT to IoFT is minimal. Okay, so here I just want to shed light on, on a key difference between IoFT and, and the, the very old topic of distributed computing. In distributed, compu distributed, distributed systems and distributed learning is a centralized system. All our data are, are available in a, in a centralized location. However, the, 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 the clients become compute nodes. So the clients are just different compute nodes in this centralized framework. And often in distributed systems, the compute nodes are, are connected with very high internet bandwidth. So they can communicate, they can access each other's local data set at any time of the training process. The difference is in IOFT, the data is not in a centralized location where you can access any part of it at any time and with very high speed because of internet bandwidth. In contrast, our data resides at the edge. The data partitions are already decided. They reside at the edge. And often also the, the, the network bandwidth or the communication that can happen with, between the cloud and the internet bandwidth cannot happen that often compared to all having all your clients just compute nodes in a centralized regime. So there are fundamental differences and that was very different on new challenges to, 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 to learning in federated in those in this federated system or the internet of federated things. Okay. And to federated analytics. Okay. So indeed, this idea of federation and, and distribution of computations through exploiting edge computing has recently gained a lot of attention from companies. Google has led a lot of efforts and right now Android 13, a lot of the new models on Android 13 like face recognition and others will be learned using federated analytics. Apple is trying to do the same thing with the quick type keyboard. Microsoft is using uh, federated analytics for their telemetry data. Facebook, and actually we have seen also some healthcare institutes right now trying to collaborate together without sharing their data by doing some local computations. So the, the, in, in recent years, we have seen this explosive inter interest in, in the internet of federated things. However, it should be noted that all the efforts right now are, are still in, the, in their infancy phase. From an application, we have still not scratched the surface. Most of the applications are just in mobile applications. And also from a theory, most of the, we have, as I, I will mention shortly, that we have only tackled a very small part of, of, of modeling approaches that can happen with an IOFT. So here I, I just should mention that IOFT is indeed expected to infiltrate all industries that can benefit from knowledge sharing, data analytics, and decision making. And, and there is a lot of opportunities of exploring new applications through IOFT, specifically ones where compute resources at the edge are available. So here, let me discuss some of the challenges in IOFT. The first challenge is statistical heterogeneity. So what are the challenges of IOFT? One of the key challenges is statistical heterogeneity. This is a fundamental challenge. And actually, as I mentioned here, it is a price to pay, to, it's a price to pay for decentralization. OK, so devices in IOFT are heterogeneous in the data that, that, that they collect. Both they can be heterogeneous in the amount of the data that they collect and the distribution. So for example, vehicles that operate under different conditions will have very different data patterns and, and data trends. And, and perhaps they can also, their input will be different. What, whatever they see or the defects that can happen will be very different across different vehicles or 3D printers. So indeed the devices operate under different external factors and they're subject to a lot of differences, okay? So there is a lot of heterogeneity and heterogeneity is a very challenging thing in, in, in the IFT framework or the decentralized framework. Because in a centralized setting, even if you want to distribute uh, utilize the distributed learning, you have the luxury to shuffle, to randomize, to understand the heterogeneity. However, in IUFT, the data resides at the edge. You cannot shuffle, you cannot randomize it. And this is the price that you need to pay. And indeed, going back to the previous model that I have shown here, where everyone is collaborating to learn one model, somehow I define this as a global model, let's say a neural network. So all the clients are collaborating to learn one model or one model that fits all. Indeed, many papers have shown that when, whenever the devices have excessive heterogeneity, 
a global model will not work. And that actually will have very different performance on different clients. Some clients it will have good performance, but on other clients it will have extremely bad performance. The other question is negative transfer, and this is a key challenge. And this goes back to heterogeneity. If you have a lot of heterogeneity, then in, at some point collaboration or collaborating together to jointly learn models might not be beneficial. Because actually the model that you learn together might be worse than each device taking their own data and just learning a model based on their own data. Based on their own data. This is what we call negative transfer. When excessive heterogeneity occurs, there is a possibility that learning alone is better. Okay. However, an interesting solution to this problem is, and this is an opportunity, is personalization. I will talk about personalization shortly. The idea of personalization is that we can collaborate together, but instead of having a global model, all of us are learning one model, we can ask each client to retain their own model. However, we borrow strength from each other while retaining our own individualized and personalized models. Communication efficiency and resource management is another key challenge in IOFT. So edge devices are not only heterogeneous in the data that they collect, but they're, they're also heterogeneous in their, their capabilities, be it in computation. They might not have the capability to run very advanced or very strong computations. Or in the communication, they, they might have bad internet connection, unstable connection. They might have limited communication bandwidth. They might just, the devices might be unreliable. So how to do inference in such a situation? How to, how to learn, jointly learn models when devices are very heterogeneous in the resources is a key challenge. And a lot of trade-offs need to be addressed in such a situation. Privacy is also a key, it, it's a key motivator for IOFT, but is also a key challenge. What happens if, if a client is, is adversarial and is trying to affect the entire learning process? What happens if the cloud itself is, is, is adversarial or poison? How to, how to deal with such situations. Bias and fairness. So obviously, as I mentioned, going back to, to heterogeneity, clients that have more data and have the ability to participate more and more, let's say in, in a phone setting, more recent phones have better connection, are more reliable, can collect more data. So what will happen is that the models that we learn will, more, will be more biased or will be, will be more favored in, in our analysis. And this, this leads to bias and fairness concerns because what is happening is our models are more representative of people, of people with new phones, perhaps people with a certain socioeconomic status. So there is a lot of challenges that need to be addressed in IOFT for it to become a reality in many applications. And indeed, the applications themselves will pose many new challenges. So as I mentioned here, IFT structures and also challenges will spawn from applications. So I just want to highlight that we started off by discussing this specific structure. We have a cloud, we still have the cloud. However, the cloud is not getting the data. It's just exploiting compute resources at the edge to get some focus updates, to get some updates, to get some summary statistics. However, this, this need not to be the only situation. So you can have a situation where the data is vertically partitioned. Let, let's take an example. You have, you have a patient, but the, pa the same patient is visiting different hospitals to do different things. So one hospital collects, collects data from a patient on a specific issue, and another hospital collects data from the patient on, a, on another issue. So basically what's happening, the sample space is the same. We have the same clients, but the feature space or the data itself is, is the, the feature space is, is distributed across different entities. So how to, how to learn in such a situation? How to do IFT and federated analytics in such a, such, a, such a common situation? This is what we refer to as vertically partitioned data, where the feature space is partitioned, but the clients are the same. Also, one can go one step forward and say, okay, I do not want to use the cloud. I want to do full decentralization. And this is what blockchain nowadays is doing. This, this explosive interest in blockchain. Blockchain is, most blockchains now, right now claim that they are fully decentralized solutions. There is no central entity that is even orchestrating the process, okay? But how viable is this option? How private is this option? It, it, those are still open questions that need to be answered. For example, if, if we find there is something that we want to remove or there is an image in such a system that should be removed from the net in general, from the internet, 
How can we do that without an orchestrator? There is a lot of not only theoretical challenges in data analytics and optimization in statistics and machine learning. There is also a lot of open questions in defining the system in, in, in itself. And as I mentioned, IOFT in general is still in its infancy phase. And a lot of applications will dictate the system structure and how to handle the analytics. However, some data-driven analytics have already been done for, for distributed learning. And, and in, in such a situation, federated learning where the data still resides at the edge. Okay. So in starting from here, I will a bit shift gears to discuss what are possible approaches that we can exploit to do model learning in IOFT. Specifically, I will talk about three different paradigms. The first paradigm is, this is how we categorize the current state of the art or the current literature in such a system. The first one is global modeling is trying to learn one model that fits all, okay? So basically, as we discussed, all the clients are collaborating to learn one model, okay? People have investigated, and there is a lot of alternative approaches that are out there that we will shed light on the possibility to be used under this category. Another category is personalized modeling. So basically, clients are borrowing strength from each other, but eventually, each client or device retains their own model. So here I'm using client, device, and edge interchangeably to really discuss the end user, depends on the case. Finally, I will discuss one category that we, we, we categorize inference in or federated analytics is meta-learning. Whereas we are not collaborating to learn a good model, rather we're collaborating to learn a starting point and initialization so that if a new client enters my system, then I, I can give them this new point, this good initialization. And through this initialization, they can get a very good personalized model based on their own individual data. So it's basically a good starting point with high activation energy, such that this point, if you give it to different clients, they can directly obtain individualized and personalized solutions accordingly. So here we categorize inference in federated analytics into these three categories, but it is very important to note that we have only scratched the surface till now. Most of what has been done has been basically focused on deep learning. This is understandable because all, most if not all the applications are within mobile applications. And, and first, order, first order optimization, specifically stochastic gradient descent. And this is also understandable because in deep learning, when you have a lot of data, then first order optimization becomes a must sometimes. Uh, so, so, so however, as I mentioned here, exploration beyond such is critical for the wide scale adoption and for IFT to infiltrate other applications compared to mobile applications. So right now let's switch gears and talk more about the mathematical side or the, the, the data analytics approaches to, for model learning in IFT. The first topic I'll talk about is global modeling. So basically in the global model, we have N clients and the N clients are collaborating to learn some global model f of w. So f is the function that we want to learn, let's say a neural network or just a linear regression, whatever model that we're trying to learn. And it is parameterized by w. Those are the parameters or the weights of a neural network that parameterize this function. So in general, when we want to learn the global model, we want somehow to minimize the average risk over, and over the clients, over the end clients. So uh, the average risk here, n is the number of clients, and fi is the risk function. And the risk function is typically defined as the expectation over the distribution of the data over some loss function, okay? So let's say cross entropy, mean squared error. And in general, because we do not know the real distribution of the data, then this can be uh, approximated by the empirical risk. So basically by the empirical loss function and the empirical risk here. So basically what's happening right now is learning global model boils down to minimizing the average empirical risk over all the clients, okay? However, the key idea that we should note here is that client I in IOFT can only evaluate their own risk function, which is the expectation of their loss. And they have no access to, to data sets from other clients. And this is the key, the key challenge, the key interesting part in IFT. So let's talk about just a general framework, just a sample framework where we are doing weight, weight sharing, how to learn this empirical risk minimization problem. 
average over, over all the clients. So basically, the input is we have the data sets from each client and they're located at the edge. Then the orchestrator in one communication round, let's start with communication round T, the orchestrator will select a subset of the clients, send them an initial model. Let's say this model is just the weights of a neural network and also definitely the architecture. What is the neural network that we want to learn? Then each client will do updates on the model based on their local data set. This is the important part. There is a client update function where the clients are exploiting their compute resources to update this global set of weights and obtain their individualized set of weights. Then those updates are sent to the client, okay? For example, weights. They need not to be weights. It can be gradients and different models will dictate what you need to share. But this is just one example. And then the orchestrator gets all the weights from the clients and aggregates them, okay? And this is what we call the server update. So basically there are two key functions in this federated analytics paradigm and IOFT in learning with an IOFT. The two functions are the client update. Basically the client is using their local data to update their model. And the second function is the cloud update or the server update where, where what's happening is that the cloud is acting as an aggregator. It's an integration point. It's taking the cloud client updates and integrating them together, okay? So this is a general framework for learning and the two functions are the key functions in federated analytics, okay? So indeed, with this idea of distributed computations and each client runs some, some small computations and sends them, it's a very old notion, specifically in distributed learning, even in centralized regimes. However, it was only brought to the forefront of, of data science and machine learning in a paper in 2017 that proposed federated averaging for learning of a deep learning model. It can be used for other models, but what, what was it proposed? It, it was proposed in the context of deep learning. And the idea is very simple. But despite its simplicity, it's interesting to see that federated averaging till this day is still one, is one of the benchmarks. It's very hard to be, specifically in learning deep, deep learning models. The idea is simple. We have a deep network parameterized by weights W. So the client in each communication round here, I should have emphasized that the communication round happens, client does an update, then the server does the update or aggregates, and that's one communication round. In the next communication round, the server or the cloud sends the new updates, the aggregated, the aggregated weights here. And then this procedure continues and iterates until some accuracy criteria is met. So in a communication round, clients do their update, then the orchestrator does, their, does, uh, does an update according to the client's updates, okay? So for the idea behind federated averaging is very simple. What they said is, Let's send WT in one communication that the weights of a neural network. And then the clients just take an average. The, the, the server update function just takes an average of the updates obtained from each individual client. That's it. So they propose the weighted average, but here, just for simplicity, let's assume all clients have the same number of data points. So just an average here. Okay, we'll discuss this a bit more later. So what's happening is that each client is doing some local computation starting from WT. For example, specifically what was proposed is running stochastic gradient descent, a couple of iterations of stochastic gradient descent. Then after running a couple of iterations of stochastic gradient descent, they obtain their individualized updates, W1, T plus one, WT, T plus one. And then the update function on the server, the server update just takes an average. So, so obviously one can see some challenges in such a system. And I, I want to try to link this with distributed systems where you have all your data in a central location and you can communicate a lot. You can talk to other clients or to other compute nodes at every iteration, at every communication round. So actually federated SGD or local SGD is an old model that we have used a lot in distributed modeling. The idea behind federated SGD is that we start from initial parameter, send it to different clients, take an average. But each client just does one update 
of the classic gradient descent or gradient descent or first order optimization methods. So each client takes the initial parameter, does one update of the classic gradient descent to take the average. Then you, you, after you're taking the average, another in the next communication round, you send it to the clients, each client does their average and so on and so forth. Okay, and this is an old model in distributed learning. However, what Fed Average has said is, okay, but if data is existing in, on, on the edge and not in a centralized server where I can just do distributed computing, then it's very hard for me to ask the clients, send me your updates at every iteration of the, at every iterate of the optimization. Instead, they ask the clients, okay, instead of doing one step of SGD, do multiple steps. And then, after multiple steps, send me the updated weights and I'll take the average. And this is the key idea and the key differentiation between federated uh, fed, uh, fed average and, and local SGD or fed SGD or distributed SGD, which people have, have investigated for a long time. And indeed, here it's important to note that taking averages at every step of the local optimization is also equivalent to averaging the gradients. You can get the exact same result just through uh, <coughs> averaging the gradients. However, one important thing to note is just by looking at this image, one can notice some, some key challenges. Is that if clients are very much heterogeneous, what happens is that each client perhaps can wander very far away from each other. So what to do in this situation? And also they can wander very far away from each other actually without, without even if they're homogeneous, but basically from the stochasticity of the stochastic gradient descent, if each client is doing a lot of training, they can move in different directions because the neural network is, is highly non-convex. They can each converge to their own location. And this is a key challenge in, in, in federated learning and federated analytics is because if, Clients can, can move far away from each other. And mathematically, one can define this as the following. Going back to this risk function, the global risk function, which is just the average over the risk of each client. It is that a critical solution of the global risk, f of w star, does, does not necessarily imply that it is the summation of the critical solutions of the local client. So a critical solution over the local clients might not, coincide, might not coincide with the global critical solution of the entire, of, of, the, of the empirical risk average over all clients. And this is a key challenge. So what, what people have done nowadays is one of the very old models is called Fed Props. It was proposed in 2000, not very old, it's 2018. But what, what did Fed Props say? It says, okay, let me, Add the penalization, this is a proxy term, to make sure that the client, this is the client objective. Typically, the client is just minimizing their own risk function, fi of w, okay? But let me make sure that the client's uh, estimate solution is not very far away, or let me encourage it to be not very far away from the global parameter. So basically the global parameter is WT. I want to make sure that the local update is not very far away from the global parameter. So basically I want to make sure that each client does not drift far away. They do not each go in a specific direction. Okay. And this idea was very simple and, and it provided very interesting solutions and improved the global modeling uh, approach specifically when we have some heterogeneity in the clients. And one interesting advantage is it allowed the clients to learn to do more steps of stochastic gradient descent. For example, instead of doing three steps here, they can do more, more and more steps, specifically because right now they are they are forced or they're in, actually encouraged not to move away from WT. And training more implies less communication rounds. That's advantageous because I'm saving cost. I do not need to speak to my clients at every, at every three or four iterations of the SGD. Okay, and this was the key idea behind FedProx. After FedProx, many solutions came in to try to align, to try to make this possible. So as you can see, when is that true? This is only true if the distribution over all clients is the same, even if the distribution of uh, all the same and we have finite number of data samples, that's, that's not necessarily true. The distribution is, not, is the same, so all the eyes are the same, and also we have an infinite amount of data. This becomes true. So what people have started to do is trying to align those two solutions, 
the local and the global solutions. Many of the works that, that are being done are based on DANE. So the key idea is what they are trying to, uh, what, what they do is they approximate the difference between the local and the global gradient. So the, the local gradient is delta F of the risk function is delta Fi, and the global gradient is delta F. So they try to approximate this difference by its value at the last communication round, T minus one. So at the last communication round, we take this value and, and by such, we try to align the gradients of the global and local objective. This is an approximation, but an approximation that often works well. And indeed, many, we have seen a lot of models along this line, and some models were actually were able to prove that they can indeed guarantee convergence even under constant subsizes of stochastic gradient descent. Specifically under constant subsizes, they were able to guarantee convergence of SGD and, and uh, under this objective to some critical location. So some of the more famous methods are scaffold, fed dyne, and fed, fed PD. And all of them are based on take ideas from Dane in order to align the global and global solutions. So besides tackling heterogeneity, another, another uh, type of methods is trying to borrow the, the, the rich literature on adaptive optimization, specifically optimization that tries to adapt the step size, okay, uh, to, to improve convergence. So as many papers bring the well-known Adam and Yogi to, to federated settings and to IFT through rethinking the server update function. So specifically, they, they define some kind of, 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 of this uh, step size, and this step size is an adaptive step size, much like what Adam and Yogi does. Okay, and those actually were, were shown that, that they were indeed able to improve the convergence rates empirically and sometimes theoretically uh, in, in federated settings. There is also uh, in adaptive optimization, some approaches that try to rethink the client side function. So the client update, for example, instead of doing adaptive step sizes on, on, the, on the, just the global server, they do it on the local server, okay? So those are approaches are, are basically borrowing the ideas from adaptive optimization to distributed and federated settings. So here, although there is not much work from a statistical perspective or probabilistic perspective, there are some work that are trying to do global modeling from a Bayesian perspective. The goal is to do some uncertainty quantification. So one of the such methods is Fed Ensemble, and Fed Ensemble asks a simple question. Instead of learning one model, instead of collaborating to learn one W, okay, one global model, what if we learn K models? Okay. And those K models can then be used for uncertainty quantification. And Fred Ensemble proposes this interesting approach to, to, to sample clients in a specific way. And then they eventually show that although you start from very different locations, although the initializations of different weights are very far away, and all the weights can, can, will converge into different locations, despite that, the predictions from all these weights belong to the same posterior, the, the same limiting posterior distribution based on a, curl, a neural tangent kernel argument. So basically, since all of them belong to the same posterior, the limiting posterior predictive distribution, then one can use these predictions to quantify uncertainty in, in, in your prediction. Another way, if you just want to get a point estimate, one can just use Bayesian model averaging. And we have seen indeed in deep learning, but the simple idea of just gathering multiple solutions or multiple points, multiple points around the critical solution and just taking the average is very advantageous. It can improve our predictions by a couple of percent, uh, but, but sometimes slightly, sometimes uh, significantly, uh, basically. And many of them have this argument, interesting argument that by taking averages, one can lead to, to, to solutions that are flatter in, or in flatter regions, okay? So this is an example of Fed Ensemble compared to Fed Average in a location where you do not have any data. So Fed Average, if you do not have any data, doesn't have the ability to quantify uncertainty. It's very confident, or it hasn't, uh, however, it's extremely wrong because it hasn't seen any data there. However, with Fed Ensemble, with the ability to quantify uncertainty, this can be reflected accordingly. Okay, so another, another area of research besides Bayesian, Bayesian methods is sampling. And it's, it's very important, as we mentioned, clients are heterogeneous in their capabilities, as well as heterogeneous in their data. So how, how do I sample clients? Because if you recall that this algorithm, 
uh, the orchestrator is not selecting all clients. For example, if you're selecting phones, some phones might, might be off, might not be connected to the internet. So, so we're doing subsampling at each stage, not in all cases, but in some situations like in mobile applications. So it's very important to decide how to sample, to efficiently decide sampling. And, and here I should note that it is often that the empirical, the, that the global objective in the, is written in, in such a way, where PI is the weight. Recall in, in, the, in the global objective that we introduced earlier, PI is just one over M. We're just taking a uniform average over all the clients. However, one can also add some weights. For example, a natural choice of PI is just to take weights that are proportional over the number of data points that you have. However, clearly this implies that the client right now needs to send back the number of data points that they have to, to, to the cloud so that the cloud can take those weights accordingly. So, so here indeed, I should mention that federated averaging initially was proposed under this, this formulation, where, where what, what they did is they do sampling uniformly. They have the probability of sampling each client is one over N, but then they take weighted averages proportional to the number of data points of each client. Whereas FedProx said, okay, no, let me change the sampling probability. Let me sample proportional to Ni over N, but then I will take just uniform averaging. And really the key idea is just to make the gradients unbiased estimators here to prove convergence, okay? However, it's, it's, it's a very interesting topic is to decide how to sample clients in such a system. So we have seen a lot of uh, methods, not a lot, some few methods where, they sample, where, where their sampling scheme is adapted. So the sampling probabilities are changed from one, from one communication round to the other. So you can see, for example, in the setting, the sampling probability is proportionate to the gradient at the last uh, at, the, at the local iterate. So basically, if the client has a large, large gradient, that means their model has not fit well yet. So let us sample more this client. Let's increase the probability of sampling such a client. Alternatively, one can just remove the gradient and put the loss function. Basically, if you still have a high loss, that means you have not optimized the model enough, then perhaps let's increase the sampling. Okay, and such a client. This is a very interesting area of, of exploration. How to sample? And this sampling is basically just based on, on right now, on the gradient, on the loss. But what about the resources? How to sample based on the resources? Because some clients cannot train a lot. Some clients can train less. How to do sampling accordingly? So another topic is fairness. It's still an under-investigated topic, but a very interesting one. And, and uh, it will become clear why I introduced this, because in fairness, many of the current models try to rethink this way, PI, to guarantee fairness or to improve, to encourage fairness. So as I mentioned, one of the key challenges is that devices with limited data or limited bandwidth or unreliable connection may not be favored by conventional effort, algorithms. So consider this weighted averaging in fed proxy and fed average. If you have more data, your, your averaging is moving more towards that's your, your specific weight or your specific update, okay? Uh, and, and here it's very important to address two different notions, individual fairness and group fairness. Individual fairness is somehow, we want to make sure that the performance over all clients is somehow close enough. Not one client is doing extremely well, one client is doing very bad. And then there is this notion of group fairness. We should also, achieve fairness over groups of clients, for example, different gender, different ethnicity, different socioeconomic status. Mm -hmm. We need to make sure that our model performs comparably well across these different groups. So here, one definition of, and this is not, this is, this is a definition that has been used often in, uh, to define fairness in federated settings, is basically <clears throat> when you have D groups, Two estimates are considered, one estimate is considered more fair than the other if the variance of their predictions across different groups is smaller. So let me just try to explain it in simpler terms. You can think about it. We have two estimates, theta and theta star. Basically, this is the distribution of the predictive performance. Let's say mean squared error. Whereas theta prime, the distribution is more concentrated, it has smaller variance. So somehow for different groups or for different individuals, the predictive performance is, is closer to each other, the variance is smaller. So basically this estimate is considered to be a more fair estimate. 
Okay. So this is but one definition. Different definitions of fairness also need to be investigated along this line. But as we mentioned, most of the methods here are just scratching the surface. This is a very new and recent topic. Okay, so here I want to shed light on, on one, one example model to give you an idea on how fairness is being dealt with. So one model is called GFER. What GFER does is simple. It says, okay, let's assume we have D groups. Here, if D is equal to the number of clients, then basically it becomes individual fairness rather than group fairness. Let's assume we have D groups. Then let's penalize the spread of the group losses. So let's make sure, let's assume you have two groups, okay? Two ethnicities. Let, let's make sure that the loss or the average loss here over clients that belong to this ethnicity and clients that belong to this ethnicity, let's encourage them to be close to each other. Let's encourage them to be close. And this is just by adding this L1 regularization. And it turns out interestingly that this formulation is equivalent to changing P or doing client reweighting. Okay, so doing client reweighting. And this reweighting is a function of the statistical ordering of the losses of the clients. So basically, groups that have higher losses will, will get higher weights. Okay, so this is why I was mentioning that most of the approaches in, in trying to rethink fairness try to play with this P okay, in some way or another. Okay. So this, this eventually it ends up basically uh, because we're trying to penalize the losses, it eventually adds as a penalty as a function of the statistical ordering of the losses. Okay. Some other approaches that, that are well known in this area, QFFL, AFL. QFFL, for example, raises the local risk of the, the, the individual risk of each client to some function Q. And this Q is determined based on, on how good the client is performing. Okay. So here I want to move. What, what I have been talking about is, is, is global modeling. Basically, what we are trying to do is we're trying to learn one model that fits all. However, what personally I think is, is a more interesting approach is personalization. And, and personalization, the idea is of personalization is that although we are collaborating together, different clients are collaborating together, the end goal is that each client retains their own individual model. But in the meantime, they borrow strength from each other. And as I mentioned, indeed, if there is excessive heterogeneity, no matter what you do, you limit the client drift, you align solutions, still your, your performance, one global model cannot capture all the clients. So your performance cannot be uniformly well over all clients. And this is where personalization can be a very interesting solution. So here in personalization, one needs to talk about heterogeneity. So heterogeneity, or the data distribution over all clients or the probability of your data tuples X and Y can be written as the marginal over X and the condition Y given X, okay? So heterogeneity can happen in the change of Y given X. So basically this is what we call a concept change. And this is a change in the relationship between X and Y, okay? So for example, if it's a linear regression, basically it's a change in the weights. So the relationship between how X affects Y is different across all clients, yet they may have some commonalities. And this is what most, if not all the literature is trying to do right now. They're trying to model a change in the input output relationship or a concept shift, mainly through this specific model where they're saying, okay, each client is modeled by the same function, but with, this, with different weights. Like a, like a neural network parameterized with different weights and how to learn those weights, okay? Another key question, which is still an open question, is how to handle a covariate shift or a shift in the marginal distribution over X. So in reality, in many situations, the input can be different across different clients. For example, in, in the case of 3D printers, different clients can see completely different defects. How can we learn across such a situation? How can we collaboratively borrow strength from each other? That's a very challenging question still. Okay, so in general, one can rethink this global objective here of a global model, of a global model to, to a setting of a personalized model by simply saying, okay, instead of learning one global model, let me learn also para individualized parameters. So here, this is still the average of the empirical risk function over all clients. However, we have two sets of parameters. W is a shared set of parameters and beta is a set of unique parameters to each client, beta i, okay? So we have beta i. So some interesting approaches along this line are weight sharing and regularization. However, I will discuss that 
some counter examples where those two can easily fail. And we will propose some other types of philosophies that one can follow in such a setting. Okay, so the first approach to handle such a problem of personalization is weight sharing. What's the key idea of weight sharing? Basically, it, mostly what has been done is in the context of a neural network, it says, okay, I have this big neural network. Let the initial set of weights be global weights and the second set of weights be personalized weights. So in the collaborative procedure, we're just collaborating to learn the global weights using Fed average per se. And then each client, we collaborate to learn W. However, the last set of weights, the last set of layers are learned locally, just based on the local data. And we do not collaborate to learn those. Now, there, uh, there is some other papers that switch those around. Say, OK, the first set of layers should be personalized, and the last set of layers should be global layers. So this is a very, very, very intuitive idea where in a neural network, you divide the layers, some of them global, some of them personalized, and you just collaborate to learn the global, the shared or global weights, okay? Another very intuitive approach is trained and personalized. What's, what happens in a trained and personalized is, okay, we train a global model W star, just using global modeling. And then much like what FedProx does, we ask the client, take W star, fine tune W star based on your local data. However, make sure that your estimate beta i is not far away from W star. So notice here, we did not split the weights of a neural network. Beta i and W star are still the entire weights of a neural network. However, beta i are personalized weights obtained after fine tuning, given the local empirical risk function and making sure that this parameter is not very far away from the global model. Different penalizations can be done. This is very much like what FedProx does. This is a Fisher, Fisher information scoring, uh, Fisher information uh, penalty based. This is the based on the well-known elastic weight consolidation model. Okay, but the idea is simpler. It's simple. Stay within the vicinity, personalize, fine tune based on your own in, the, in, in your own data. However, stay very close. Stay within the vicinity of the global model. And indeed, we have also seen a lot of advanced models along this line where they say, okay, instead of doing it in a trained and personalized, so you just train a global model, then you personalize, let's do it in an iterative manner. So at each, at each, uh, at each optimization iterate, what we do is we, we, we use Fed average per se to, to learn W star, but at the same time, we also try to find beta i. And we do it over multiple steps iteratively. We'll not go into the details. Some, some, some algorithms, D2, D2 is basically using very similar ideas to here, but it says let's do it iteratively using federated averaging. But the results eventually ought to be very clo close because we're, we're trying to stay as close as possible to W star at each round. Another very interesting approach is PFEDME. And PFEDME introduces some relationship between beta i and W star. Here the update for beta i and W star are somehow decoupled in this iterative process. I will not go into details, but basically the, what I want you to remember here, the take home message is that both approaches and the approaches here follow this trained and personalized philosophy. Okay, they start with a global model and using this global model, they op obtain the personalized model. Okay, be it in, in one shot just at the end or iteratively. Okay. However, such an approach that depends on a global model can easily fail. And this is one counter example. It's a very simple counter example. Assume that all the clients will have th their functions are just sinusoidal functions with a phase shift. And this is very often common in vibration signals. And they assume theta i belongs to a uniform distribution on zero one. So one can show that if we follow a trained and personalized approach, okay, to learn such a model, then the best model that we can learn or the global model W star that we are able to learn is one that always predicts the function as zero. Is one that always predicts the function as zero. And what happens more is if you add regularization here in those trained and personalized or, or the, in such approaches, you're asking your model, okay, personalize, but make sure you're not very far away from an extremely bad model that predicts everything is zero. So we're actually augmenting this problem. So this idea about starting with a global model, I will not go into details about this counter example, it's actually very simple to prove. But the key idea is 
if we start from a very bad global model of, or if we collaborate, it's very easy for us to collaborate to learn a bad global model, specifically in the presence of heterogeneity. If we collaborate to learn a global model, then, then restricting our personalized estimates to be close to a global model will hurt us because the global model is a bad model to start with, okay? So an alternative approach is multitask learning. Multitask learning is, is based on the philosophy of establishing a shared representation across all clients, okay? So, so the key idea behind multitask learning is that we are trying to learn, if you look at the figures here, is that we are trying to learn the personalized parameters without having any dependence on W or a global model. Okay, and typically uh, multitask learning has been explored a lot, be, being it in, 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 in settings where being it using regularization. So here the shared representation across all clients is enforced using some regularization on all the weights, okay? With some correlation matrix across clients that models the relationship between clients. We've also seen a lot of multitask learning using multivariate Gaussian processes. So there is a lot of possibilities. What ha has been done in multitask learning is very, uh, just a few papers exist along this line in a federated setting, and they're all based on linear, linear regression. The exploration beyond that, how to do how to do federated analytics where we're learning parameters without any dependence on a global modeling. It's a very interesting topic to be explored. So here I also want to note that personalization is also another interesting, semi-personalization is also another interesting topic. So what we discussed right now is that we are all collaborating to learn for personalization, to learn and individualized models. A global model is learning one global model, just one model, but can we do something in between? where we collaborate together, but to learn K models, okay? So basically the idea is to cluster the clients over K groups, and the assumption is that within each group, the data distribution of each clients are the same, or, or the clients become homogeneous within each group. But semi-personalization is very challenging because in a federated system, how can you cluster clients? If you're sharing weights, are weights of a neural network enough to do clustering? Probably not. Actually, the answer is no. Are, are gradients enough to do clustering? Because in a centralized regime, how, did we, how do we do clustering? We have all our data. We, have, we do clustering on the data to, to get the clusters on the tuples of x and y. But in this situation, we are clustering based on summary statistics, on focus updates. And the question is, what are the focused updates that can ensure clustering as if we are clustering based on the data? And this is a very hard question to, to do. And because actually our answer might be something that is not privacy preserving, that requires us to share parts of the data or some very, very informative statistics about the data itself. But this is a very interesting and, and a rather open question in this area. So here, I, I finally want to talk about one paradigm of learning. I will not discuss it a lot because the, the literature on it is still very scarce. However, in federated settings, it's called meta-learning for federated settings or for the internet of federated things. The goal of meta-learning is actually, as I mentioned, is not to perform well on all tasks and expectation. Instead, to find a good initialization that can directly adapt to a specific task. Okay, so basically what we are trying to learn is we're trying to learn a starting point that can enable fast personalization. This is the key idea. And in centralized regimes, this has been explored extensively. And the, and the most famous model, that actually one of the, the initial models was the model agnostic meta-learning. And the idea was simple. The objective of model agnostic meta-learning is shown here. Basically what it's saying, let me minimize the risk over all the clients after one step of gradient or stochastic gradient descent. So basically what this entails is I'm trying to learn a weight such that after you do one step of gradient descent, you can minimize your loss. So basically this weight becomes some kind of a weight with high activation energy. If you do just one step of descent on it, you can get very good estimators. This becomes the idea of meta-learning. This meta-learning becomes very important in federated settings because in IOFT, we do expect that new, new clients will come into the system. 
we need to achieve personalization fast, and this is by we need to achieve this transfer learning from one client to another in a fast way. And one way to do personalization is actually through meta learning. And one, there are some clear extensions to a federated setting. Whereas instead of averaging the gradients over, over all, all the clients, we can average the gradients after getting, so delta fi here is the gradient at the end of the communication round. So we can, by, by averaging the gradients at the end of each communication round, one, one can also achieve meta learning in such a setting. I will not go into details. I strongly encourage you to read the paper where we introduce not only uh, <coughs> frequentist approaches to do meta learning, but also models where instead of learning, instead of learning one good initialization, we, we discuss some interesting models and po some possible alternatives to learn a prior, basically a starting distribution. What is starting from this distribution, you can condition on this distribution to achieve fast personalization. The, most of the details are, uh, can be found in the paper. So here, I, I want to end by noting some interesting open problems. And definitely by, by the open problems that I will discuss, this is not an exhaustive list. This is a very new topic. And, and the open problems will be dictated by the applications, okay? So here, as I mentioned again, IOFT is still in its infancy phase. Infancy phase. Most of what we have seen in IOFT and in federated analytics are basically just on an algorithmic level, developing algorithms for deep learning using first order stochastic optimization, okay? But very little has been done in, in, in developing statistical models. There is a lot of topics to explore, graphical models, how to learn a graph over clients, correlated inference. What happens if you have correlation? Zero and second order distributed optimization. Can we move beyond first order methods? Validation and hypothesis testing. How to quantify uncertainty? How to do distributed and federated design of experiments? How to do Bayesian optimization? What happens if different clients have conflicting objectives? They're not trying to solve the exact same problem. How to, and this becomes just a game theoretic problem how to distribute reinforcement learning. So there is a lot of methods, be it an optimization and statistics and data science in general, that are yet to be explored in this paradigm beyond deep learning alone. So here I want to shed light on some of them from both a statistical perspective and an optimization perspective. So from a statistical perspective, one problem that comes to mind is dependence. Can I move beyond empirical risk minimization? So for example, if different clients are dependent, how to learn a network, how to learn this dependent structure. And indeed learning a network or learning a graphical model requires, requires second order statistics. So it requires some pairwise interactions between clients, how to do so, okay? And how then, if, if I'm able to learn a, a graph in IOFT, how can I use this graph to improve my prediction, improve my control, improve my decision-making? Very interesting topic. Another one is correlation. What, what if not only the clients are correlated, but the data inside each client is correlated? So SGD in the presence of correlation, be it across clients or be it within each uh, client, there is correlation, the, the gradients become biased. How can we use SGD? How can we rethink our methods in such a situation? The gradients are biased and there are some recent papers that, that actually prove that convergence only can happen when we have very large batch sizes. How can we do that? Okay. Then we have uncertainty quantification and Bayesian methods. Indeed, there is not much done in this area. But if you think about it, that IOFT in itself is a hierarchical system, okay? We have the global orchestrator, Okay, and then we have the clients. So hierarchical base is a very natural approach for model learning in such systems. Then also definitely how to quantify uncertainty in such systems. I, I discussed Fed Ensemble, but Fed Ensemble is perhaps one of the very few works in that area. But, also, but prediction, we really need to, to express our confidence our, in our predictions for successful models. Then statistical heterogeneity and personalization, as I mentioned, how can we quantify statistical heterogeneity? How can we answer this question? When do we need to learn a global model? When do we need to learn a personalized model? How to do clustering, as I mentioned here. If we have excessive heterogeneity, can we cluster different clients? And finally here, I, I end by noting in this perspective is that the probabilistic perspective in personalization is often needed. When we talk about statistics, we always think about, okay, when pers personalization in statistics is often based on mixed effects, 
we add this probabilistic thinking into, into our modeling. And through probabilistic thinking, we can achieve personalization. But how can we bring probabilistic modeling to personalization, specifically in, 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 in IOFT and beyond deep learning? Those are very still open questions. Another one is how to do hypothesis testing and, and model validation. So we have not seen statistical modeling. And, and it's, it's understandable that we might not want to impose statistical models, okay, because of the restrictions. However, however, so one can, for example, one, one, one question is how to impose this probability distribution. We mentioned that all the models that are doing personalization right now in deep learning are just yi equal f, f wi of xi. Can I impose some kind of a conditional probability distribution? Then if I impose some statistical structure, okay, how can I impose the structure for WIs? A graphical model will help me learn a network. A low, a low rank assumption over W will help me cluster, do some sparsity assumptions. So how to do that? How can I extend such models beyond deep learning to models that are more amenable to statistical inference and perhaps model validation and testing such as kernel methods, such as Gaussian processes. Another interesting question is domain adaptation. How to deal with the shift in the covariates or the input space, okay? And another very interesting topic, which I believe is decentralized design of experiments and Bayesian optimization. So interestingly, we have a great opportunity nowadays. We can collaborate to optimize our designs instead of one person doing a design of experiments and finding the best, let's say, process parameters in a manufacturing setting, we can collaborate together to do this process design and optimal design process. But how to do that in a collaborative way that preserves privacy? Those are very interesting questions from a statistical perspective. And also from an optimization perspective, some, some questions that are raised is how to choose the number of local steps. As we mentioned, if we do a lot of local steps, convergence becomes very challenging, okay? Because clients will drift away from each other, even if they have the same data distribution just from the stochasticity of STD and the highly non, and the high non-convexity non-linearity of deep networks per se here. So how to decide on the number of local steps given the model? How to move beyond uh, uh, first order methods? How to do min-max optimization? In such a situation, in fact, many of the deep, deep, and of the fairness formulations can be formulated as min-max methods. How to extend those to federated settings? Then resource, how to add resources? So research, resources can actually be posed as constraints on my objective. But how do I decentralize a constraint optimization problem? It's also a very interesting question. And finally, how to do a full decentralization. If I want to remove completely the dependence on a cloud or a local global, global orchestrator, how to achieve that? Those are some very open questions. And again, I want to mention that we have only scratched the surface. In this paper, we categorize model learning, the global modeling, personalized modeling, and meta-learning. But that's based on what's, been, what's done right now. But we envision that as IOFT will infiltrate many applications, we will see different modeling approaches, rather interesting ones. So yeah, I just want to point out some possible solutions that, that might be interesting to just, to just guide you on some, just highlight some interesting ideas on how to solve those problems. For example, a covariate shift. One, one way to handle covariate shift is using the ideas of encoders, decoders, or variation autoencoders or GAN. So basically, to, to start from the function space, extract the, using an encoder, extract the start from the input space, extract the input space into some common from some common feature space, and then do inference accordingly. So here theta becomes an encoder and G becomes a decoder, and beta I becomes the personalization happens in this encoding, then GW is a, is a global decoder. So this is just one possibility just to shed light. Another interesting approach is. How to federate, as I mentioned, how to go to more statistically amenable approaches. So how to federate Gaussian processes per se. So interestingly, if we are able to achieve federated Gaussian processes, what happens is in a Gaussian process, we're not collaborating to learn weights. Basically a Gaussian process is learning a prior. So what happens if we, if we federate a Gaussian process, we're, we're, we're collaboratively learning a global prior and then personalization becomes automatic. 
because each client can take their prior. How does prediction happen in Gaussian process? You take the prior, you condition on your own data. So your own data encodes your, your individualized features. And this becomes much like meta learning, where we're jointly collaborating to learn a prior. So there is a lot of interesting problems that can arise from such a settings. And again, I've said this much many times. We have only scratched the surface. And finally, I want to end by briefly discussing that in the paper, The Internet of Federated Things, we, we, have, we have a very large section on how will IUFT impact different applications or how will different applications will be re re refigured and, and restructured based on IUFT. We talk about distributed manufacturing, how manufacturing with IUFT can be massively democratized and distributed energy, how we can decentralize the control of energy, transportation. So from the, from the lens of domain experts, they, they describe on, on their vision of IUFT within different industries, business, manufacturing, energy, transportation, and others. So here I will leave it to the paper. And I want to end by noting one thing is that so while writing this paper, it, it, it really became clear to us that there are very little real life data sets and the ones that are exist that that exist to, to, to test IOFT and to test federated analytics are basically within mobile applications. However, real data sets with the defining features of the underlying systems are needed to unveil the potential challenges in different domains and actually unveil the opportunities of IOFT. Indeed, as I mentioned here, only with a deep understanding deep engineering understanding of the underlying system and domain, we can formulate the right analytics. For this reason, we created this website. This website is, is not a repository, it's just a directory. A directory of both general purpose data sets for, for IOFT and for federated learning, and then real life based data sets from each different domains, transportation, manufacturing. Our goal is really to encourage researchers to, 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 to explore federated analytics within their specific domains and, and shed light uh, <clears throat> on, on their data sets. Um, so, so basically, what, what in, in this website, what we have is we have the data set, we explain the data sets, and, and then we provide the link to the repository of the research lab or the researchers where the data set is available to the public. Okay, and by this, I end the talk. Um, thank you.